I'm Peter, I'm from the EELS team. Um, EELS is an acronym for Ethereum Execution Layer Specifications. And we're working on the future of how do you specify the execution layer. So we've just heard about how the consensus layer do their specifications in Python. If you think what I'm talking about is similar, it's because that's where we got the idea from. Before I begin, I want to talk about what I mean by the execution layer. We're only here interested in the state transition function. So you have like a long chain of blocks, you have some state, you add in some new state. And the question is, firstly, is that block valid? Are you allowed to add it to the state? And secondly, what is the new state afterwards? We don't care about anything else. We don't care about networking. We don't care how you implement reorgs. We only care about what is this state transition function. Um, so currently, let's suppose you're like someone you want to know about the state transition function, the execution layer, how it works. Where would you go for information? Well, the first place you could go is the yellow paper. Well, I have the yellow paper here. This is a lovely extract that explains um, what the header validity conditions are. And some people think this is readable. Um, they are in the minority. Um, if you're curious about the like weird mountains, um, they're not mountains. That's how mathematicians write and. Um, the other problem with the um, yellow paper is that it's actually really out of date. Um, this is the Berlin version. The reason it's the Berlin version is because no one's implemented London yet. Um, secondly, you can look at EIPs. EIPs are individual slices of like changes. They're specific change proposals, and they're like. You can look at them and you see the history, but they're, they're not, you don't, they don't tell you about the relationship. They only tell you about individual changes in isolation. So if you, like, for example, if you, re, you can read EAPs where it's like, well, this thing says this and this thing says this, but how do those two things interact? And you just can't get that from the IPs. Um, at that point, you can then go, OK, well, I'll look at the test suite. And the test suite is great. It is full of loads and loads of tests, but ultimately, it's just a pile of tests. It's not particularly well organized. Um, and if you want to find some behavior, like maybe you can find somewhere in the test suite where that behavior is tested, but it's not specifying anything. And then you can just give up and look at the GEF source code. <laughs> Um, I, fundamentally, if you've like, got to the point where you're reading the, having to read the client source code to work out how the execution layer works, we have failed at specifying it. These clients, they are big, like, complicated, high-performance uh, pieces of code. They're not like, designed for the reader. The other thing about specifications is they need to be part of a standards process. Um, you can't just like say, oh, well, we're going to implement all this stuff, and then we're going to update the specifications later. This is the big problem with the yellow paper, is that it's not part of it. No one like, proposes a change by saying, this is how I would change the yellow paper. And so the yellow paper just gets updated later on as an afterthought. Um, the other problem is that the yellow paper is just like a document. It's not, it's not executable. You can't test whether it works. Um, and this applies to EIPs as well. So, this here is a sample from the EIP that changes how the cost of the mod X precompile works. It was proposed, it was accepted, and you're like, this is nice. There's a nice piece of easily readable Python that says exactly what it does. Problem this is this Python is wrong. Now, no one has ever executed this Python. <laughs> because if they had, they would discover that it doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> um, and I mean, as Donald Koo said, beware bugs in the above code. I have only proved it correct. I haven't executed it. So you need a, so this is our approach. Um, we want to start with like a code first approach to specifications. Um, we take like Python, and we're not just writing any old Python. We're like trying to create the Python that if you opened like some programming book and someone had an example algorithm, it's that Python. So we don't use classes, it's just methods and um, effectively structs. Uh, this is like the common language. All programmers speak this. Um, you know, anyone who's done any programming will immediately know what this is. You don't need to like, understand pure mathematics like you do with the yellow paper. Um, and crucially, it can be executed. We can test it. If you want to know what the Python, Python does, you can run it. If you want to compare it to a client, you can run this. You can run the client. Do they do the same thing? Um, we're, we're purely here interested in readability. We don't care about performance. Um, it's extremely slow. It can sync mainnet. I think it takes about, probably going to take about six to nine months if you want to start from Genesis and get to the head of the chain. It's not a viable client. Um, we also make some very weird like, design choices. 
uh, we look at um, hard forks in isolation. So if you have various, if you go, you'll see it's Ethereum slash Azure slash Ethereum slash Frontier and slash Homestead. And each of those is an independent implementation of those hard forks. So this is like terrible for like code duplication. Like literally every time we do a new hard fork, there's like this massive copy of like um, thousands of lines of code. Um, but it's great if you're like a reader. If you want to read it, you know, you can see like how Homestead works completely in isolation. You don't have to have to think about how it relates to other things. Whereas if you read a real client, it's just a pile of like, if we're later than Spurious Dragon, do this thing, otherwise do this thing. Um, if you do want to see look at comparisons, though, we're developing specialist diff tools, and those diff tools um, allow you to compare. Like this is exactly what happened. This is the specification for um, Frontier. This is the specification for Homestead. This is what changed exactly line by line in code that we have tested. Um, so here's a sample. This is the S load opcode to give you like a, a feel. Um, a number of things here. Firstly, you can immediately see we've really tried to make it as readable as possible. Uh, we've also divided it up into these like individual sections, which we've given headers. Um, this actually like matters. There are a number of quite subtle semantics that the EVM has that relates from the fact that gas um, calculations are done before any computation is done, and you can get very confused about some of the subtleties of particularly the call op codes if you don't realise this. Um, now I want to move on to like now we have these things. How can that like? affect the development process? How does having these specifications make improving and building on the EVM better? And I think it's helpful here to think about two sides of the development process. On one hand, you have like your R&D people, think Vitalik. Um, and on the other hand, you have implementers, um, think Peter, who's the GEF team lead. Um, the R&D people, um, they're doing research. Um, they want to throw together some simple Python. They don't really care about the performance. They just want to write it, test it, and think, is this a way we should do this thing? Um, on the other hand, you have the implementers who are trying to write a robust production-ready system. They want to know every single subtle detail of every single thing that has to happen, because if they get it wrong, that's a major security incident. And also, they have to like, spend all their time thinking about the subtleties of like, DB disk performance, which is an endless bugbear for anyone who has worked on the execution layer. Um, and EELS provides a common framework. It allows these two sides to talk to each other. It's a common language. Um, your R&D people, they can write that Python. And this is what they do already. When they're doing their research, they write little Python models. Well, now you have these specs. If you've written that little Python model, you can like, stick it in EELS. You can implement it in EELS. It's not much more work. And already, you have, like, you have something that you can then show to the implementers. This leads to this sort of development process. You have your R&D people. They develop their idea. They prototype it in EELS. Um, you then give it to us at the EELS team, and we, as part of like, the governance process, integrate all of those things together. We make a hard fork. Um, exactly what goes in, obviously, is like a thing for all core devs. It's not like we're taking all the power here. Um, and critically, once you've done that, there's a whole bunch of things you can do because you have an executable spec. We, our executable spec will be able to fill all the test vectors. It might even be able to like, run its own very miniature like 2 million gas a block test nets. Um, that means that you can have tests and precise specs before you've even written a line of code in your production clients. This like, frees up um, production clients to not have to be also the R&D playground that they, that they sometimes are. This is not like a perfect thing. Like often you have to go and implement models in production clients to deal with performance issues. There are networking issues we don't deal with. Um, but currently, like anyone who wants to propose any like significant change, they have they like implement it in GEF or wherever. Um, whereas now you have this playground to do it in. And critically, this is like a sort of parallelization stage. Because like currently, you know, you Currently, you have this like, situation where like, the implementers and the R&D people like, get, have to like, interact much more tightly. If you have this like, EELS process, you can like, separate that out and do these in parallel so that you can like, have the implementers finishing up one hard fork while EELS are like, getting ready to prepare the next hard fork. Whereas if you're like, busy modeling things in GEF and the implementers are also tied into doing the R&D, you just don't get the same parallel efficiency. Um, I should now talk a bit about where we're at. Um, we have implemented all the hard forks. Um, uh, the merge is still a PR, that's not, but we're nearly there. Um, we're going to need to do a bunch of like um, refactoring, um, 
and then we need to um, freeze the code. Because we're asking people to like, build it. We're saying, if you want to take any IP and you want to build on top of that, uh, change it, you're here, you have to take our, our latest fork, copy it, implement your own changes. And we can't ask people to do that sort of thing until we freeze the code and said we're not going to like, refactor it under you, and we're not quite there yet. Once we've done that, we're planning to like, shadow the current governance process for Shanghai. So Shanghai is going to go through in exactly the way that all previous like, hard forks have gone through. But we're going to also be working with a whole bunch of people to try and implement those change changes as EELS proposals. And then we're going to like, see how the governance process works. And then hopefully we can like, improve on that and talk about moving away from some of these legacy approaches to specifying execution there. Finally, um, there's the question of how you can help. Um, firstly, we don't actually need your help yet. We're still, um, uh, co we're still coding. We need to finish that. Um, once we've done that, um, we ask you to like, implement your favorite AIP. Um, and like give us feedback, like how was it? Because we don't want this to be a world where we, as like the Eels team, can like develop what we want, develop things, and we can propose changes, but no one else understands it. I don't want to be in the situation that you're currently in with the yellow paper, where actually only a really quite small minority of people know how to write tech um, and how to change the yellow paper. So I want this to be like an open process where anyone who's like, oh, I want to propose something, can just clone our repository, run the new fork tool, and. Um, implement their change and like produce a proposal without being burdened by having to think about like how the GFDB works or whatever or wherever else they're going to do their modeling. Um, yeah, um, that's the end of my talk. Um, we are have plenty of time, so do people have any questions? State growth. So if I make a commit to the execution spec and I want to see how that influences state growth over time and like the capability to run a node and things like that. Have those sort of things, those mutations, been thought about at, from a uh, you know metrics gathering level? Um, I mean, this is a thing that like people who implement this like think about this all the time. Um, like, I mean, yes, because we hold the whole state, you can like model that sort of thing. I think a lot of that is mostly about gas pricing and gas accounting. And like, there are advantages here. So for example, there was a proposal um, about how withdrawals worked. And because I have the execution specs, I could like, look up the table of gas prices in the execution spec and say, well, this is how much this sort of thing should cost. And like, yeah, but I don't, I don't think our tool is like, particularly useful for like, modeling state growth particularly. You just need to understand like, what actions can cause state growth and how much gas those, those cost. How is this going to interact with the uh, reference tests that the uh, eels? There's a lot of crazy edge cases in reference tests, um, such as integer boundaries and other strange things. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've had a lot of fun with crazy edge cases. I should do a talk on crazy edge cases once. They, at some point, they are amazing. I mean, firstly, we run all of the reference tests. So if you go in our test suite, you type tox. Um, the automatic um, like, test suite will run all of the reference tests. And so currently, we pass every single one of them. And I have like, learned an awful lot about the crazy edge cases of the EVM. We actually hope to go further than that. You know, we want to be the canonical builder of the um, execution tests. So, so currently, for those who are not familiar, we have test fillers, um, which are like, te they're not like complete tests. They say, here is what the pre-state's like. Here are some assertions about what it should be like per state. Then you run, you take a client, um, it's usually GEF, and you run a filling process that gives you a completed um, reference test. Um, that reference, te uh, reference test, and it tells you what the state route is, and it tells you basically exactly what the block should be after you can perform this execution. Um, we will think that we should be like the canonical filler of those tests. We can fill them before the execution clients had even implemented those tests, um, and then we can if you want to, and that means that clients can like, use the test to build their clients, whereas currently, until you've implemented something, you can't fill the reference tests in. You have to implement it a production client. Um, there is also, and I haven't thought about it in great detail, the question of whether we should use the, whether we can like, analyze the structure of the of eels to like, generate new reference tests and basically do some sort of path analysis and say, well, these are the possible paths through this sort of code base. Can we follow every possible path and make sure there's a reference test that follows every possible path? But that's like R&D that we like, haven't done yet. You mentioned you implemented um, 
no, you, you care only about state transition function, and uh, that means you implemented your own EVM, and you can fill the test, and, and uh, you provide the post state hash. Yeah, like uh, if you have a chain, and you want, if you have a chain, and you want, and you have a block, and your proposal is to add that block to the end of that chain and update the state, we could tell you, we, our test specify exact, our thing specifies exactly um, whether that block is valid. Are you allowed to do that? Because blocks, I mean, particularly valid blocks, tend to be invalid. Um, in that case, you're just not allowed to do it. And if it is valid, it tells you what the state changes are, and then you can do the next thing. We don't do anything else. That's the only question we answer. Um, so this is obviously uh, inspired by the consensus specs or the Pi spec. Are there any particular architecture changes or learnings you've gotten from the Pi specs? Oh yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Okay, so there's a couple of differences here. Um, the first one um, is that the um, Pi spec, is, the consensus Pi spec, is a document. Um, that can be it is, a, is a bunch of documentation that can, can be compiled to code. Um, so if you look at the Pi spec, it's a bunch of MD files with some code in, then there's a compilation process that spits out code. Um, we are a bunch of code um, that is um, that we can then you can then compile using standard documentation tools to documentation. Um, the second big change is the Pi spec does this like incremental building stage, where um, in the Pi spec, you have phase zero, and then you have Altair, and the Altair documentation just adds a few changes to the phase zero. Whereas what we did was we copy, we copy the entire thing um, and create a new version that contains everything, which means, because otherwise what would happen is if you wanted to know how um, the merge worked, in Paris works, you'd have to read Paris, which would say these are the changes versus London, uh, and then London would say, well, these are the changes versus Berlin, then Berlin would say, well, these are the changes versus Istanbul, and it would just keep going on and on. And so we don't think that's a particularly good way, especially because a lot of the historical details are really quite legacy and not things that people need to be concerned with nowadays because they've been changed out. And so we just like do isolate, they're completely isolated files. This causes like a whole bunch of code duplication issues. Um, and complexity, but it does mean it's like really it's simple. You can read a particular fork completely in isolation from any other fork, whereas if you, you can't do that with the consensus specs. I was wondering for the executable specs, how do you think it might change and improve like the EIP process of Ethereum? There was lots of conversation in terms of governance of how when you're proposing an EIP, maybe this should be like a requirement to kind of speed up the testing process, but would love to hear your thoughts on how it could be integrated and what parts of it it could improve um, to, to change that, that EIP flow. So, on the one, so there are some people um, who think that we should get rid of the EIP process for the um, execution layer. We should abolish EIPs for the execution layer, and instead you should have whatever EELS proposals are called. And it should just be, if you want to change the execution layer, you write an EELS proposal, you might write a small amount of ancillary documentation, but mostly you just write a PR. There are other people who think that we should do a like, hybrid process where there is a EIP and the EIP comes with, as like a mandatory component, a EELS change. Um, I actually don't have a particularly strong opinion of this. I can see the argument for both sides. Um, yeah, but there, there's lots of thoughts on this. I generally take the attitude that I'm going to wait until like we've started using this and people have like seen it in production, and then they can start talking about what they actually want to do. <laughs> 